As you may have heard earlier in the news today, wildlife rangers in Kenya shot dead five suspected elephant poachers during a prolonged gun battle. More from our reporter in Nairobi, Duncan Monene. This is the most recent incident in what seems to be an aggressive stance against poaching in recent months by the Kenyan government, bringing to six the number of suspected poachers killed around the country in a span of two days. According to the Kenya Wildlife Service, the early morning incident left five suspected poachers killed. Two rangers were also injured in the confrontation that lasted for more than 40 minutes. Elephant tusks weighing 50 kilograms were also recovered together with three AK-47 rifles. Poaching in Kenya has reduced significantly since 1980s and 1990s when poachers nearly destroyed its elephant and rhino populations, but there has been an upsurge in recent years. Just last month, the Kenya Wildlife Service said it had increased its efforts to hunt down poachers and had killed six poachers this year who are hunting for elephant, buffalo and rhino. The Kenya Wildlife says it is determined to make poaching a high-cost, low-benefit activity after elephant deaths in the country increased in recent years. These efforts, the government says, are meant to combat poaching that has been caused by a surge in demand for ivory from China in spite of a long-standing ban on the international trade. Duncan Munene reporting. Well, let's talk some more about the issue of wildlife conservation. Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka and Lawrence Zikusoka are a husband and wife team running an organization in Uganda called Conservation Through Public Health, CTPH. They say wild animals can be protected by improving the health and livelihoods of human beings. So how do you do this? First to Gladys. We've set up community-based healthcare networks who are now called community conservation health volunteers. And these are people selected by their community who visit every household each year and take information about hygiene and sanitation, how it relates to gorilla health, conservation, ecotourism, sustainable livelihoods. And at the same time, they take services. They look out for people who've got TB or scabies and advise them what to do and also take family planning services. You don't provide medicines or ongoing health care to the local community, do you? Yes, we do. We do it through the communities, through the community volunteers. What sort of things do you say or do to persuade people to be mindful of the conservation of the gorillas, for example? Well, we say to them that if they're healthy and hygienic, they will be less likely to make gorillas sick because they won't get diseases. If they don't make the gorillas sick, the gorillas' numbers will grow and there will be more tourists coming to Windy and that money will translate towards building up the community. And then also it makes them realize, oh, the gorillas are very important. They also bring out the message that it's not good to poach. It's not good to go into the forest illegally to collect firewood or bushmeat because we're getting so many benefits from having the gorillas being healthy and being here so that people can come and see them. Okay, so you've mentioned gorillas there and you do work in Bwindi National Park in Uganda. Is poaching an issue there? Poaching is no longer an issue in Bwindi because the communities have benefited so much from tourism that, in fact, if a poacher tries to come, everyone alerts the park authorities and they go and catch the poacher. So when you hear the news just now about five suspected elephant poachers being killed in Western Kenya, what's your reaction to that news? That's really terrible because Kenya had actually got poaching under control. Hang on, what's terrible? The killing of suspected poachers or the poaching itself? Good question. The, the poaching of the elephants is bad. And I guess they had no other choice but to kill the suspected poachers and stop it happening again. Because actually these poachers who were killed, yes, they needed money in their pocket, but it's much more of a bigger issue. There's some trade going out there. You know, obviously when they lifted the ban on ivory, these poachers now have a market. And so that's greed. You know, it's not so much the case of they're looking for food to feed their families. Lawrence, now you're a specialist in information and communication technology, laptops, internet, computers and stuff. How does ICT assist wildlife conservation? Well, in Bwindi, when there was no internet, there was a call for action. And what it meant was that people had access to internet through satellite connectivity. Since then, telephone networks have also been set up where there are towers and masks and 2G, 3G connectivity. Okay, so you put in a campaign for internet connectivity in Windy National Park. Exactly. And at the time, I'm sure people must have said, well, animals don't use mobile phones and internet, so why are you <laughs> doing this? Well, for the livelihoods part. I mean, the livelihoods, uh, of the... the livelihoods of the people that live in and around Windy National Park. And since then, we've also set up a but... second center in Queen Elizabeth National Park again, for the livelihoods of people that live around the protected areas. But can you see a measurable result between improving the livelihoods of the people living 
around the national park, in and around the national park, and the welfare of the animals? I think in some ways, yes. In terms of the welfare of the animals, it's easier for us to have better data collection and information dissemination. Gladys, well, a lot of the cases, it's more a case of behavior change. That's the biggest thing that you can measure. Behavior change in, yeah, in, in who? The, in the human beings yes. and um, in their conservation practices and attitudes. And that's what we measure. I mean, for example, with the telecenters, we found out that the youth were more involved in conservation issues. And as we said, you know, people are less likely to poach a gorilla. But in the case of Queen Elizabeth National Park, we had anthrax in hippos. And the community around the area believes if you eat a hippo, you're going to have many children. So they encouraged the young brides to eat hippos when they've just got married. And how did you address that? We basically sent messages to their mobile phones about the dangers of eating wild meat and poaching. And we also... But was developed. that true, though? I mean, was there a danger in eating wild yes. meat, or was it just your side of a propaganda? Very much there was a danger, because once you eat an animal that has anthrax, you die. And a few years earlier, there had been people had eaten these animals and died. And was that particular campaign against eating hippos successful then? It was. The, this year, you know, people didn't eat the hippos. Even if they brought a dead hippo or animal from an unknown source, they didn't eat it. So you changed long-standing cultural practice? We did. And actually, people poached much less because they, we realized that if I, I could end up poaching and get sick. What about, though, the poaching for hunger, poaching for bushmeat? I really think the poaching for bushmeat, OK, you know, people need to eat. They need to survive. People need protein. They really do. And in a way, we're addressing it indirectly because we're trying to get people to have the children they can afford. So we started a family planning program. And uh, in these very communities that are bordering the national park, because you can have the children you can afford, you can feed them, you don't have to go into the forest to look for extra food. You can give them an education, they can get a job, you can break the poverty cycle, they can, they'll have less diseases to make themselves sick or to make the wildlife sick. And that was Dr. Gladys Kaleme Zikosuka and her husband Lawrence Zikosuka of Conservation Through Public Health, CTPH, based in Uganda. That's all from the team today. I'm David Amano. You're listening to the BBC World Service.